we've been going through a series. This is my last Sunday to prepare you for Passion Week. And uh, see if I can get this to the right page. There it goes. Hallelujah. Because David will be here next week to share with you, and the Sunday after that will be the beginning of that very special week that we set aside annually to celebrate our Lord's death and resurrection, beginning with his coming into Jerusalem on what we have called Palm Sunday. Our theme has been Lead Me to Calvary, and today we're going to go up a mountain and see Jesus revealed in all of his glory. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bible, if you would please, and turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 36, whatever form your Bible takes. Let me give you some background, and then we'll get launched there, shall we? Luke chapter 9, 28 to 36. As far as the gospel is concerned, the transfiguration was the only occasion during Jesus' earthly ministry when he revealed the true glory of his person. You'll see this story told three times, Matthew 17, Mark 9, and here in Luke 9 as well. We are told by scholars that the occasion of the transfiguration took place on Mount Hermon. You see that big mountain in the background? That's Mount Hermon. Can I tell you something about Mount Hermon just for, just for the Hoas? It's the only place in the world where you're two hours from a desert and you can go, uh, well, you can go skiing. Mount Hermon is covered with snow all winter long, and that's where Jewish people go to enjoy a day on the ski hill. And Mount Hermon is likely the place where Jesus, well, he wasn't there to ski. He went there for today's lesson. He took his disciples to a mountain, and somewhere on Hermon, he encountered the Lord. In Matthew 9, 28, we read about eight days later. You say eight days later, eight days after what? Well, let's talk about that because the setup is as important as what's about to happen. It was eight days after Simon Peter had his own significant moment of divine insight. Jesus said to his disciples, he asked them, who are people saying that I am? And they responded, and then he said to the disciples, but who do you say that I am? There's a question that rings through the ages. And Peter answered and said to him, God's Messiah. Then in Luke's telling of the story, Luke 9, 21 and 22, he strictly warned and instructed them to, them to tell no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. There's a revelation. It went right past them. John tells us he told us, and it didn't register till after. But he told them. How many times has God told you something? How many times did your mother tell you something, and it didn't register till after the fact? You went, oh... Is that what she meant? <laughs> right? Same thing happened to the disciples. Verse, chapter 9, verse 23, And he asked them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. He's telling them what their future is going to look like after the resurrection. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. That thing doesn't do that. There we go. <laughs> then he said, For what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their very self? Then Luke chapter 9, 27 is the setup for today's, today's lesson. And it says, I'm stuck again, Caitlin. Well, that's not what it says, but you know what I mean. Hit the button of wonders, Levi, can you? Thank you. Truly, he said, some are standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Jesus has been revealed as the Son of God. He has told his disciples clearly what's about to happen. Now he says, a few of you are going to get a picture of something nobody else has ever seen or we'll see until that day. Let's pray and get started. Father, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts 
as we step into the good things of your word, give us your instruction that we may go on our way both rejoicing and refreshed, prepared for all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. Luke 9, 28, which we started earlier, about eight days after Jesus took Peter and John and James with him and went up a mountain. I wonder if you've ever stopped right there, just pause, push pause at that point, and asked yourself this question, what is the significance of Luke's constant comments about Jesus regularly feeling the need to go off and intercede by himself and on this occasion and others within the company of a few select friends when he goes away to pray? I mean, isn't Jesus God's Messiah? Isn't that what we just heard? Isn't Jesus like the Son of God? Like, why does he always have to keep going off to pray? He goes off to pray because he's one of us. He set aside the glory of heaven and operating right now as though he was you or me. He is one of us in this circumstance. And just watch how often he heads out to pray. I don't know if you realize his humanity meant his contact with the Father rises or arose from the same playing field as our own. It seems that to fulfill the mission he was given, he was constantly pressed towards regular prayer and prayer retreats as he followed the direction of the Spirit. Peter Story was an Anglican priest in South Africa in the days when apartheid was still here. And Archbishop Desmond Tutu was part of his circle, and they were struggling together to end this injustice. He said, often those struggling against apartheid would come to Johannesburg, rent a room for the night where several would stay. There'd be as many of, as 10 of us in this room. And one night, Peter said, I awakened at 4 a.m. by the sound of shuffling feet. He said, I looked over in the corner at the chair and saw a body draped in a sitting, draped in a white sheet in the corner and realized that it was the bishop and that he was retreating from us for a few moments to have a few moments of quiet and closed prayer without the distractions of the world around him to prepare for the day that was ahead of him. It was Archbishop Tutu repeating, retreating from the world for a few minutes. Then story writes that Tutu would leave the work and go away for two days of contemplative prayer and silent retreat. And everybody else is struggling to get the mission and the mandate moving forward. So one day, Story confronted Desmond Tutu and said, Why are young men and women dying? How can you leave us alone for two days a month? And Desmond Tutu answered, I leave and go on retreat for two days a month so I can do the work God has called me to do the other 28. And so we see Jesus deserting the crowd periodically who was always around him. Even most of the disciples he would shed on occasion. And on this occasion, he takes Peter, James, and John and disappears to prepare his heart for the days that are ahead of him. Do you do that? Do you prepare yourself? Do you recharge your batteries ever? Dr. Billy Graham once wrote, I watched the deckhands on the great liner, the United States, as they docked the ship in New York Harbor. First they threw out a rope to the men on the dock. Then inside the boat, the great motors went to work and pulled on that great steel cable. But oddly enough, it wasn't the pier that was pulled out to the ship but the ship that was being pulled snugly up to the pier. Prayer, Dr. Graham said, is the rope that pulls God and us together. It doesn't pull God down to us. It pulls us up to him. Have you been there? 
Have you attached yourself to the great ship of the great ship of grace to the harbor have you set the motors and gotten yourself prepared in prayer as the motors pulled you from earth to heaven to commune with your heavenly father to retreat like desmond tutu did in the middle of crisis as the crisis is around you now and is overseas pulling you towards god so that you can deal the other 28 days with what's coming before you Jesus did. Maybe that's why he spent so much time in prayer. Maybe the events that accompanied being continually in the public, public eye pulled his focus and his energy from God like it does you and I. So he habitually took time to be in Father's presence just as a way of energizing and maintaining his alignment with purpose, renewing his energy, his direction, and his focus. As Desmond Tutu said, for the other days that were ahead. Our account continues, Luke chapter 9, verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning, and two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but they came fully awake when they saw his glory, and two men were standing there with him. As the men were leaving, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Luke says he didn't know what he was saying. Luke tells us that Simon Peter didn't understand what was going on. He was in the blur of heaven. How many of you have been there when you woke up and you were only half there for the something? Peter woke up. You notice that Peter is always sleeping at prayer time? Can I make confession? We used to have early morning prayer meetings with a previous administration six o'clock prayer meetings and we had midnight all night prayer meetings and the previous pastor looked at me and said when i get you into a six o'clock prayer meeting when i leave at seven o'clock you're asleep on the bench he said when we have all night prayer meetings by two o'clock in the morning you're asleep on the bench do you have like a window for a prayer somewhere mid-afternoon or something when do you like wake up I feel like Peter. I understand his pain or his process. Luke chapter 9, verse 34. My PowerPoint is way behind. I'm all locked up again, fellas. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered him, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what it was that they had seen. And back down the mountain they come. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate that. So here on the Mount of Transfiguration, we see Jesus exposing a limited measure of his glory why because the bible tells me that god lives in unapproachable light well this was approachable in fact they could see what was going on so was this all of jesus glory not a chance but a measure of his glory was displayed in this moment we read that his appearance changed and his face and his clothing were as bright the NIV says, as a flash of lightning. We see him in the company of the two leading lights of the Old Testament, Moses the lawgiver, Elijah the prophet. And we hear the voice of Father God, this is my son whom I have chosen. 
So what do we do with all this? Well, let's begin with Jesus in his glory, shall we? These men that day saw the radiance of Jesus. Peter had already announced in verse 20 he was the, the Jesus was God's Messiah. Some of the other disciples were probably still uncertain. So at least for James and John and Peter, this mountain experience proved, provided confirmation that what had come, about, come out of Peter's mouth and Jesus had affirmed as true was in fact true. He was God's Messiah. And that was important. But what I want you to see in this moment when his raiment becomes like lightning flashing is how this all comes to pass. Notice where he was. When did this all happen? While he was praying. Notice that Luke tells you that all kinds of things happen in prayer. That the radiance of God, the transforming power of God comes to you and to me as it came to the one unique Son of God in a season of prayer. It happened after prayer. Jesus was praying and all of a sudden something began to happen. While there is no one else who can compare with our Lord in his radiance and glory. Be reminded of the revelation and the transformation that came to him in the context of a time of prayer. There's a story about an 18th century German sculptor by the name of Johann Heinrich von Danker. Danker is known for carving the Greek goddesses as well as one of John the Baptist, but his finest sculpture, we understand, was the one he did of Christ. He writes in his diary that he worked on this first sculpture of Christ for two years. After two years, he did an experiment that he always did when he did these things. He took his sculpture out into the street into some small children and asked them this question. Who do you see? He said his child looked up at the statue sculpture that he had made and said, a famous person. A great man. Dunker knew that his impression of Christ had failed, so he took it away and undertook the project again. And for the next six years, he says, he toiled with his chisel to recreate the masterpiece. When he was finished, he tested his work on the street once again. He took it out on the street and asked a little girl, Who, he said, do you see? She looked at him, looked at the statue, looked at the statue again and said, Jesus, he said, I knew at that moment that I had captured it. Dunker confessed later that during those six years he had sought Christ and felt Christ had revealed himself to him in a vision. He said, I simply transferred the memory of that vision to the marble statue and it was said by one who was familiar with his work that Christ's face was so tender and strong that strong tender and beautiful rather that strong men wept when they looked at it <laughs> later Napoleon Bonaparte asked Dinecker to make a statue of Venus the Roman goddess of love and Dinecker said a person who has seen the Christ can never again employ his gifts on the gods and the goddesses of men. Peter, James, and John experienced Christ in some measure of his glory. If there had been any doubt in their minds whatsoever that he was the Messiah who was to come, I'm sure they evaporated in that moment. They also saw him not only in the they not only saw the radiance of Christ, they saw him in fellowship with Moses and Elijah. This is significant too. I love the way Barbara Brown Taylor describes it. To see him standing there with Moses and Elijah was much like seeing Mount Rush, the Mount Rushmore of heaven, the lawgiver, the prophet, and the Messiah. 
wrapped in such glory it's a wonder the disciples could see them at all you might remember too that both of these men had their own mountaintop experiences do you remember that moses went up on the mountain to receive the commandments from god Exodus chapter 34, verse 29 and 30, we read this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Why is Moses' face radiant? He had done what? He had spoken with the Lord. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do we call that? Prayer, thank you very much. Jesus is transformed at what point? He is in prayer. Moses, the great lawgiver, stands in the presence of God. And Moses, who writes Exodus, by the way, who is telling his own story, right? Says he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. And when all the Isra Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. That's how brightly Moses' face shone. In fact, verse 33 says that when he had finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. Eventually, the Bible tells us the radiance faded from Moses' face. But verse 34, oh, says this it's not in my notes but it's in your bible whenever he entered the lord's presence to speak with him he removed the veil until he came out and when he came out and told the israelites what he had been commanded they saw his face was once more radiant then moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in again to speak to the lord in the cloud Moses' face became radiant every time he came in contact with the Lord in the tent of meeting just outside the camp. He would speak the words of the Lord and then go about his daily duties. And 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us what happened in those hours was that as he began to deal with people like you and I do, what happened? The glory began to fade until he did what? Went back into the presence of of God. Are you hearing something? Now we're a little different than them. Second Corinthians chapter 3 tells us that the glory of that covenant was fading, but the glory of God that comes to us as the Spirit of God's at work in our hearts takes us from glory to glory. Yeah, we get into the presence of God and experience the glory of God because the Spirit, Jesus said, he who is with you will be in you and the spirit of god has come in us we don't dim in glory but every time we go into the presence of god the bible says this from glory to glory he's changing me and if you want your life transformed then you're gonna have to do what moses did you're gonna have to walk where jesus walked and get into the presence of the father because from glory to glory he's changing you now elijah elijah he had his experience with god on horeb You'll remember he had fled the wrath of Queen Jezebel after killing all the prophets of Baal and restoring rain to the land after a lengthy drought. It was the deep low after a tremendous high when she threatened him after that great day, deflated and full of fear, and then in full rebellion, he ran from God and Jezebel. And finally ended up in a cave on Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, it was called in those days. First Kings chapter 19, verse 11 to 13 reads like this. That after he had been there, the Bible says he was there for 40 days. Interesting that lots of things happen after 40 days. The Lord said... Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. 
Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, you know this one, came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. And the voice asked him and said, what are you doing here? And that's how he asked it, too. Because he'd been in fear and then in rebellion. How do I know he was in rebellion? If you go back and look at the start, God said to him, come out and stand on the mountain and see. And the scripture tells us that that Elijah stayed in the cave until what? He heard the voice. And then he covered his face. Why? Because in the Old Testament, if you saw God in sinful state, you would die. So he's got his face covered because he knows God is out there waiting for him. And you do not keep God waiting, but you cover yourself up for protection. And a great prophet who had been through a great struggle covered his face and stepped out into the presence of God. After that encounter with God, after 40 days away from all of the trouble, with the fear and the rebellion, after his encounter with God on the mountain, he climbed down off the mountain and walked right back into the mess that he had run from. Transformation happens, friends, in the presence of God. Is God talking to you this morning like he talked to Elijah and asking you the same question? What are you doing here? I have plans for you. I have purposes for you. What are you doing here? I don't think he's asking you what why you should be in church. But he may be asking you why you are at where you are at. If the voice of God has been clear in your past, and rather than face it, you ran. Perhaps today, like Elijah, you will turn and walk boldly back into the turmoil that you have run from in days past. Here's what I know. You can't encounter God's presence without something significant happening. The third thing that I see today is that they heard the voice of God. They heard the voice of God. While he was speaking, the Bible says in Luke 9, 34, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid. (laughs) As was Elijah. And a voice came from the cloud. That sounds familiar. Saying, this is my son, whom I have chosen. There's a word to study. Listen to him. This is why Jesus had brought them up on the mountain, not just to pray with him, but to clarify something that had been said that they were familiar with from one of the men who had been on the mountain that day. His name was Moses. Moses had said to them back in Deuteronomy, here's what he'd said in Deuteronomy 18, 15. He told Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your fellow Israelites, you must do what? Listen to him. And Father in that moment affirms, this is the guy. This is the guy that you are to listen to. Father identified Jesus as that one greater than Moses in their hearing. And so the words of Jesus the Christ are declared by God 
to supersede the two men whom with whom he stood? He didn't say, listen to Moses. He didn't say, follow Elijah. He said, this is my son. You listen to him. A new covenant was coming. A brand new day was dawning. And who was going to bring it all to pass? My chosen son. Listen to him. Jesus was the Son of God, and his words were to reshape life and proclaim and define the character and nature of a new covenant. Jesus' fellowship that day with Moses and Elijah confirmed that he was in no way in conflict with them. He was walking in the way of the law and fulfilling the words of the prophets and doing the will of the Father. It all came together in one glorious, radiant moment on the side of a mountain. This is one of the holiest moments in Scripture. This is revelation at its clearest and best. Father unveiled Jesus as the Christ to the disciples. They saw a measure of his radiance. They encountered the primary men of the old covenant and realized that Jesus superseded them both. Pastor Quentin Morrow tells about a cartoon that appeared in Christianity Today some years back. There were three, three scenes in the boxes. The first one showed reformer Martin Luther quaking with fear and sweating, and he says these words, In the pages of Holy Scripture, I encountered an utterly holy God, and there I learned I was completely unable through my own good works to equip myself and quiet my own conscience before him. I was Luther. Scene two showed John Wesley, the greatest revival preacher and the father of Methodism, with arms outstretched to heaven, crying, God's holiness revealed in his holy word, convicted my sinful heart. And there I discovered in his presence that I was undone. And after reading Luther's commentary on Romans, my heart was strangely warmed. The final box showed a 21st century woman with frizzy hair and large spectacles and big earrings, and her face is smiling and saying, in Skip and Jody's Bible study today, I discovered that I needed a checkup from the neck up. I don't need another diet. God wants me to learn to love me. Friends, is that all we've got? Is that all we've got? A checkup from the neck up and self love? If that's all you've got, you didn't get it. You missed the memo. Men and women before you and I have stood in the presence of a holy God. Here's the thing I under, uh, that, that, that puzzles me most. Everybody says, boy, I'd sure like to talk to God about this. You know, every person that I've ever met that's actually had that kind of encounter, like Job, like Elijah, all of them are going like this. They are afraid. And somehow these people boldly stand in the presence of God and are going to tell him here's what I know. You never met him. Here's what I know. You've never encountered him. For all your learning and education and all the splaining that's been done to you in your lifetime, you've never met him. Because if you did, it's okay, Lord. No, just turn it down a notch. It'll be okay. Whatever you say, is that what happened? Moses standing in the burrow, standing in the desert, looking at the burning bush, pulls up to the burning bush, and God says, Take off your shoes. Moses not only takes off his shoes, he hits the dirt flat out, face drowned in face ground in the sand in front of the bush. You want an encounter with God? <laughs> You'll know when you get it. I 
wonder if it's even possible to talk about an experience of holiness and the majesty of God in so many levels in today's world. But when they saw him that day, he was praying. And in prayer, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. And two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor. And Father spoke and said, this is my son. And when Father spoke, they were what? They were afraid. The angel walks into the room with Mary, and what is his first words out of his mouth? Fear not. You encounter God. I still remember the story Ern Baxter told years ago. He worked with a traveling evangelist for many years. He said we were in Johannesburg. And great revival meetings were happening. He said I was traveling with a healing evangelist. Fabulous things were happening, but we were having great oppression great struggle, many bad things were happening, and we had taken a season for prayer. He said, and I found myself on my face before God in the room with the evangelist beside me. He said, and all of a sudden fear came over me, fear like I have never known in all my life. And the evangelist looked at me and he said, the angel of the Lord has just walked into the room. Don't be afraid. He's here to help. He said, in that moment on, things changed because God sent help. And whatever your circumstances is, circumstance you find yourself in today, God sends help. God is ready to walk in, but a final question I think is in order. Father said, this is my beloved son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Are you listening? Have you heard? Have you been in the presence of God? Have you been up the mountain of prayer and caught a glimpse of his glory, seen his majesty? felt his holiness? Have you been in communion with God and seen the divine radiance and been renewed and refreshed like Moses and Elijah who both walked back down that mountain and got back to work as did our Lord and his disciples? One man testified in one of D.L. Moody's meetings. He said, I've been living on the Mount of Transfiguration for five years. Moody took a hard look at him and said, so how many souls did you lead to Christ last year? Well, I don't know. Has anyone been saved? I don't know that any have, the man said. Well, said Moody, we don't want that kind of mountaintop experience when a man gets so high that he builds three tabernacles and won't come back down to reach out and love and speak and save poor sinners. There is something absolutely wrong with that picture come on down please go go to the mountain experience god then come come and work among us walk with us and let us hear the testimony of god come through you as you are strengthened and renewed in his presence shall we pray Father, this morning we stand in your presence. Because you said if two or three of us would get together, you'd be here. So we believe you're here. Thank you. Holy Spirit, you promised that you would go wherever we would go. So you're here too. Thank you. Jesus, you said if we would receive you, that you would take up residence with us and go wherever we went. So you're here too. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Spirit of God, take the feeble words of this feeble minister. 
and do with them what you need to do. For I am weak, but you are mighty. I am weak, but you are strong. And the circumstances that my brothers and sisters find themselves in this week, may they too find that though they are weak, you are strong. Though they are inadequate, you are more than adequate. Though they cannot conquer, you will make them more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. I pray that you will lift them up and send them out to testify to your goodness and glory for the honor of your own great name. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things and for his glory alone. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Pastor Mick, would you wrap up our time together?